Welcome to This Week in Location-Based Marketing, the most trusted podcast dedicated to the new business of location. Hello, everybody, and welcome to This Week in Location-Based Marketing. This is episode number 119. We are recording this live Saturday morning, March 2nd. March 2nd, 2013. My name is Rob Woodbridge from Untether.tv, located in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. With me, as always, located from the heart of Canada, right? Well, I don't know. Only when we beat the Ottawa Center. Oh. But uh, yeah, Asif Khan from the Location Based Marketing Association. And uh, yeah, it's almost as cold as it is in Ottawa. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I thought we had emerged here. You know what? I thought. We we are uh, we are I think March God March just it's it's eternal hope when it comes to Canadians and weather and for those of you who are listening that don't suffer through the winter like we do, good for you, good on you. Yeah. Yes. Well, we are here to uh, bring you the latest news and insights and our opinions. Sometimes they get a little bit long, but they are our opinions uh, about what's going on in the location-based marketing world. The, the biggest news items and why those were the biggest news items of the past week. Got always going to bring you an app. A special app that that really does focus on the location-based marketing world, special guests, and of course a resource of the week at the end of the show. And uh, but before we jump into that, I, I we always talk about what's going on with the location-based marketing association, simply because you're doing so much, Asif, and you were in Las Vegas and then Atlanta this week. So talk about the last this past week of travel for you. Yeah, just two two great events. I mean, first of all, uh, the bigger uh, one uh, it was in Las Vegas, the Digital Signage Expo, the largest gathering of digital out of home uh, vendors, marketers, uh, you know, users, uh, retailers, uh, etc. So, uh, great event this year. Um, I had been once before, and um, just uh, I was amazingly surprised to see how many people were talking about you know the relationship between mobile devices and digital screens. And I mean, that's what I was there to talk about. I, I gave a session on location-based marketing and integration with uh, digital out of home. And uh, but just to hear the the buzz around, you know, the importance of mobile and the importance of understanding from a location perspective who's standing in front of a screen and what that means in terms of ability to influence the content and the message on the screen and you know that interaction between the two, um, you know, uh, devices um, was really really interesting to see that. Uh, that it's on everybody's mind now, and um, so yeah, just a great, great turnout, great, uh, great uh, new new technologies, new displays coming from all the biggies of NEC and Panasonic and Samsung, and everybody uh, was there, and um, yeah, it was it was just a great event. And then uh, moved over to Atlanta on Thursday uh, for our own event, the LBMA Atlanta uh, chapter held an event, and uh, we had a uh, phenomenal uh, panel with. Uh, a law firm, a uh, Coca-Cola moderating it, uh, Gonna Be, which is, uh, we're going to talk about those guys shortly as, as our app this week, um, uh, as well as Scout Mob uh, was on that panel and 22 Squared and Agency. So good diversity on the panel and uh, just a great discussion about privacy issues in particular and, um, you know, different, you know, the differing uh, opinions and views on that. And, uh, and we talked a lot about you know the incentive for driving um, folks you know to share location, and and one comment I heard from from the agency guy that uh, really stuck with me and and is, uh, you know when he said that when they're thinking about leveraging location or putting out an app uh, on behalf of a client, um, you know they're they as an agency are now thinking about you know this whole this whole premise of when you download an app one of the first things that you get is are you willing to share your location. You know that pop-up that comes up, and uh, and 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 he made a statement um, that was he said, "Why are we asking people for that question? You know th that question about you know are you willing to share your location without first you know explaining the value to them of what they get for sharing their location." Um, and and so apparently from from a design perspective as an agency creative wise. Um, you know they're they're looking at ways in all of their projects uh, to make sure that they're demonstrating or explaining the value proposition before they ask that question. So that that was uh, you know a, a nice thing to hear. So it always it always strikes me that that you know it's a gate 
you know, we talk about gates, especially in the location world, is that if you pop that up, the first thing that comes up is saying, like, you know, are you willing to share your location right away? Most humans are not willing to share that without, uh, you know, generating some kind of trust between the two, between you and that brand. And it always, that's, that's a gating issue. It's like, put, you know, the first screen being a login screen. Those are gating issues. And, and uh, you, you know, you probably have a, a zero to one percent chance of getting people to to log in without actually any interactions, and I've seen that with a lot of apps that um, you know, specifically in the app world, and even in the in the mobile websites. But you know, even Google doesn't land you at Google Maps and says, "Hey, can we see your location now? Can we? Can we? Can we? Can we?" Only when you initiate an action like a direction, I want to I want to find this location. Do they well, say? Well, it's because Google, it's Google already knows what yeah. it is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they just don't tell you. Exactly. <laughs> they, they're they're doing that as a as a as a kind of an appeasement, right? Because they they've been tracking mm. you for, since you were born, basically. For some of you, um, you know, uh, uh, it's it's fascinating. Uh, before we before we move off of this, the the event in in uh, in Las Vegas, it's a um, I don't think it's a surprise that that mobile is playing and these devices are playing in such a such a big role. And we've always talked. I mean, for many episodes, probably all 119 episodes, we've talked that the conduit to location right now is the glass that you carry from uh, basically your smartphone. And and we've 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 had many stories in here about uh, trying to onboard the location. You know, so we've had you know wacky vending machines and on screen stuff and everything that. And the smarts reside on those screens or in that vending machine. And what, what we've always talked about, really, and I'm very glad to hear this, is that these devices are, are that key, uh, are basically the gateway for location for, for some of these smart terminals and some of these smart displays. And, and it's good to know that, that well, we, we've been on the right track. Yeah, so you could pat, for pat sure. ourselves on the back there for a second, you know. Hmm. All right. Um, then we've got a big show, so we're going to jump into it. Uh, certainly, we've got our app, which, as you alluded to, it, it, it is going to be me. Can't wait to hear your impression about that. Our special guest this week is John Fisher, who's the co-founder and CEO of Crowd Optic. It's a company we've talked about before. A uh, very fascinating interview, and we've got our six great stories. Um, an amazing, an amazing video uh, by Qualcomm uh, and uh, this uh, bus. Uh, I, I can't even describe it. Like the future of the bus, uh, the bus shelter campaign that they've done is pretty amazing. And um, but and then of course we got our resource of the week, which is a fascinating look at how uh, well uh, you know th that ten mile range. We're talking about social, local, and mobile. Uh, you know, some characteristics around wh what people search for and what they're looking for uh, from a mobile device and how many times they search for a mobile device or a tablet versus a PC. Very, very, very cool infographic on that. So what do you say we get things started, Asif? Well, yeah, let's do it. All right, let's get started with the app that you're fascinated with, Asif Gonna Be. Now, you, you were with uh, this, this app uh, at your event in Atlanta. What, what is this thing? Why should we care about it? Yeah, I mean, th th going to be is really uh, an app that looks at uh, future location. Uh, you know, where, as the name implies, where are you going to be? Um, and you know, the connection of of future location to events, and um, you know, so so think of it as a a, a mashup in some respects of Facebook events with. Uh, Forecast, which was an app that uh, was built on top of Foursquare, where you would uh, sort of uh, check into where you're going to be in the future. Uh, so if you take Facebook events, combine it with uh, with Forecast and maybe a bit of PlanCast as well, all rolled together, what you get is going to be. And um, you know, so they describe it as a social life concierge service. Uh, they've had great coverage on this thing, uh, you know, on all the major uh, media outlets, Forbes and Fast Company and Read Right Web, and everybody's talking about them. They're down. Uh, they're based in LA, and uh, yeah, I had the pleasure this week of uh, uh, we had Hank Lieber, who's uh, the founder, uh, on our panel this week, and just a super articulate guy. This guy knows, you know, uh, knows his stuff, and, and uh, you know, and he's passionate about uh, you know bringing uh, innovation to uh, the event business, and and, uh, and and you know, all of that being very much tied around location. And they have managed to secure some great partners. They've integrated uh, live ticketing from Ticketmaster and Live Ticket. I mean, it's pretty. It's pretty amazing how how quickly they've they've come on and and done a, you know escalated this thing. Uh, and it, look, I, I'd love to know where I'm going to be in the future. That's that's all I'm thinking about. So, all you, you know, I, I think that a lot of the credit card companies and the debit companies and the interact companies can and can actually tell me where I'm going to be on a Saturday afternoon, pretty much based on my my past and my history. 
But uh, this is this is fascinating, and I like the the. Uh, I like the way that they position this is that, uh, you know, they, a lot of people say that, listen, Facebook, Facebook does this. Facebook is getting into this space. And we hear that a lot about companies these days where Facebook and the big behemoths like Google get in. Um, but they only touch the surface and, and companies like going to be are going to expose. Uh, they're going to go deep in one small slice and they're going to expose people to new ways of doing things, not just checking in, but not just telling you where you're going to be, but uh, being able to, uh, you know, find find the best spot for that suits their interests and and Facebook's not not there yet. Facebook might get there. They might survive till there, but they're too big to to kind of dive this deep into one little piece. Yeah, and, and this is the kind of thing where, you know, we've we've seen it over and over again, right? Where, you know, a company like a gonna be, and I'm not saying this is happening by the way, but a company like a gonna be, you know, kind of goes deep in on a particular slice, as you say, they prove it out and then, you know, they grow their user base and then Facebook acquires them. <laughs> Right. I mean, it, we saw it with Instagram. Right. We saw it with Goala, uh, where you know they 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 either you know prove out their capability uh, from a technical perspective, or they, you know, just get the get the user base on board, as Instagram did with with photos. Uh, it's not that Facebook didn't have photos before; they did. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. They just now have it, you know, better <laughs> and, and more focused. Right. And uh, and I could see something like this where you know the event the event piece of Facebook sucks honestly yeah. it's it's terrible yeah, it does so so you know if gonna be can can improve on that if they can focus on that niche and, and it's all about location around this this is you know this is this is about saying you know th this is that problem of you know you're hanging out with a bunch of people and and, and to some extent you've got uh, a bit of the glimpse uh, functionality in here too right so this is like you know that ability to say I'm gonna be here. But you know, share my location with you know these five people. Um, tell them we're going to be hanging out for the next three hours. Uh, that kind of thing, um, you know, so that you you don't have to do the group texting, you don't have to like track people down, all that kind of stuff. That's the space that we're talking about here, and I, I really like this this functionality. And we're, we'll uh, we'll get Hank on the show as well as a guest shortly, and uh, I'm sure uh, Rob, you, you'll you'll have a great time interviewing them. So. Well, it is, and you know, it's just so funny. Just, I think you said where I'm going to be three times in there, right? And uh, you know, it rolls off the tongue very well. Great branding on this, and and I can't help but think we've got a story about banjo coming up as well in our main news item. And I can't help but think, but there's, you know, uh, th there is another path than to be acquired by something like Facebook, right? And rolled up in that is that uh, I think that there's complementary services between banjo and going to be and a bunch of other companies that that actually, when you start to think about them from an investor standpoint, how can you roll those into or partner with these guys? Uh, to be able to um, create a, a better experience than something that Facebook could create inherently, or, or even if Facebook would buy something or Google would buy something like going to be, what, um, you, you know, they could just bring it in and destroy it. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all for companies that want to be in this to build a company, not to just build the flip. And, and you know, there's all, obviously alternatives other than the, the two big guys that are buying right now. So if, if you are interested, go to going to be app dot com you can find it in the app store or uh, you can find it on android as well but gonna be app dot com just exactly how it how it sounds very cool and i will look forward to having them on as a guest on tether we can dive into their revenue model which is what i'm almost exclusively interested in try to figure that out good one asif yeah all right so we got uh, six great stories we're going to start with our first story of the week um, and get a little bit of insight into this Here's a Toronto company, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, Gardley. Um, they are, uh, you know, we, we talked about a company uh, maybe last week or the week before, uh, indoors. We, we're starting to see, obviously, this massive trend towards indoor uh, location aware and location pinpointing. And uh, Gardley um, talks, uh, is, is bringing their, uh, you know, they've had this service for indoors, but they're really bringing the service for um, alerts and for um, um, emergency services. So talk about what Gardley is doing here. Yeah, so Gardley's, uh, it's an app that's been uh, available for a while now um, that is, is focused on public safety. So th this is all about, you know, sharing your location um, in, in real time so that you can, you can draw emergency services to right to where you are when you, when you need help. Um, and historically, with the Gardley system, this, is, this has been, you know, sort of leveraging GPS technology. Um, so, you know, primarily available in, you know, public settings, outdoors, um, you know, when there's an accident or, you know, um, you know, you need help on a playground or wherever you are, uh, you, you could, you can hit a button on Gardley and, and people can find you instantly and, and, and come to your aid. Um, 
what's what's the new thing here is is that uh, they've launched this indoor positioning component uh, on, on top of the uh, sort of the standard service. So now, um, you know, if you're on a campus or uh, you're in a in an office building or wherever you are, you have that same uh, ability to kind of summon uh, summon help uh, to to wherever you are in a building. Um, which which is really cool, and and they're doing it, you know, using you know the normal stuff, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and you know radio frequencies and and all that kind of stuff. And the nice well, other nice thing about Garley is is um, you know the system is is based on a premise of two-way communications, right? So it's not just a you know broadcast a signal to where you are and uh, and help will arrive. Um, you know, it, there, there's actually it opens a two-way channel of communication between you know the those providing the the help and and you as a uh, as the injured or or person in need so uh a cool use of location a very um uh, functional use of location in the sense of you know bringing uh bringing help uh, when there's when there's an emergency situation yeah this this is a uh, obviously this is a trend that we're seeing um and and these devices that beyond 911 um just calling 911 this is I always picture it is that you know you are you're walking down um, you, you know you're walking out to your car on campus or you're you're walking home to your dorm or you're leaving your work late at night and and there's always that security of having this device with you you've got it with you but I love the concept of the one of the one touch literally like the the one touch alert to say listen I, I'm in duress and it sends out a call to 911 it calls all your friends it sends uh, you know text messages everywhere and the only thing that it needs is like a photo uh, opportunity right like you just hold it up and say okay now I got your photo so if anything happens to me they know who you are because that photo has now been broadcast a around the world basically to anybody who cares um, but I always think you know um, if you're in duress, call 911 first, right? Don't 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 mm -hmm. launch your start smartphone. Don't call your mother. Don't call your father. Don't call anybody. Just call 911. They're the ones who can help. Your dad can't. Um, but I, I really like this. And they're talking about a 44% as a result of using these things in campus. A 44% um, uh, increase in speed, right? In reaction time. And uh, I, I really like this kind of stuff because it serves a, a purpose. Uh, I think I think the only failing here, Asif, maybe maybe you can correct me is that uh, this is a smartphone only device and I, I don't like that uh, as, as much. I, I think that uh, there has to be a, uh, a feature phone because there still are those 25 or 50 percent of the people that carry devices. They're just feature phones and, and, yeah, yeah. and this, this, it, it can't be ubiquitously rolled out if, if you don't satisfy that requirement. I think in a couple of years it'll be predominantly smartphones but Right, and, and that's why, I mean, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the Ping 4 alerts yep. Yep. Uh, stuff, right, yep. which is going in the same market. Like, it's, it's you know, uh, the value of Ping 4 alerts we were talking about was on campuses and, in, you know, yep. in buildings and stuff like that as well. Yep. And the ubiquitousness of that, I think, is it, for me, is more interesting. Um, and the other thing about the Garley stuff is, yeah, it's smartphone only. It, currently, it's only, this new piece, uh, the indoor piece, is the only Android. Android. Yeah, weird. Yeah. Um, and and that, and there's a revenue model tied to this. So so this is actually a paid uh, upgrade on top of the standard um, you know Garley offering. Yeah. So we'll see what that means in terms of you know can they get any traction around this? It, it's a it's a business that that the carriers at some point um, you know uh, we sound like a broken record here, but it ends at the carriers because the carriers own that network, right? And and. Uh, and you see Rogers getting into the home, right, which is home uh, monitoring and uh, alarms because they've already got you in there with your, the box that sits in front of your television set. So it's a natural extension to be able to use these guys for monitoring. Um, and they have the infrastructure to be able to do that. And I think that what happens when, when the carriers and the providers like that get into the schools, get into uh, onto campuses and into uh, into businesses like this, where you know you you know you have um, guaranteed uptime. There's no chance of it going down. Uh, there's redundancy. They've they've been certified in all of the uh, e-secure requirements and and uh, e911 and all of those kind of things because they have the back the backbone to be able to sustain this. So, mm -hmm. um, but I love it because what we see with the, in the mobile space and what we see with guys like Gardley, guys like indoors, guys like Ping Four Alerts, um, they, they are they're proof of concept. Um, and, and I think that they, that's where the innovation happens. So, you know, Josh and his team are doing great and I love it. And I love the fact this is Toronto based. Yeah, for sure. So go to, uh, it's guardly.com. Um, if you are interested in a little bit more information from these guys, that's uh, G U A R D L Y.com for a story. Wow. Canadian company. 
Our second story, uh, you know, I we, we talk about Damien Patton all the time here and, uh, and his company Banjo, and it's been a while since they've been in the news. They've released a number of new products. We had a great, great, great privilege of sitting with Damien um, at uh, Untethered Talks last summer. Great, great, great guy. I love this guy. Great story. And they were selected by Google to be one of the first apps out of the gate with the Google Plus, the new Google Plus integration, which I think is a an honor bestowed on only a few great apps. And and uh, Damien and his company Banjo were selected here. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I love this app. Uh, you know, this this Banjo app. This is this sort of background, passive location awareness um, uh, of where people are and what they're doing. And, and you know, the, the Banjo app is interesting in itself because it's it's really about you know eavesdropping, if you will, on you know the conversations. That are happening uh, at events and, and at specific locations around the world. So they describe it as you know you can't make it to the Super Bowl or you can't get to the Oscars or whatever. You know, follow the conversation on site, on location. Um, you know, through through an app like Banjo, um, and, and that's that in itself is really interesting as a as a kind of news uh, collection uh, you know vehicle. I mean, think about what a CNN or you know somebody like that could do. Uh, you know, with 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 a banjo, and uh, you know this announcement, this this integration with Google Plus is, uh, I think, it's exciting for banjo in the sense that, you know, that it streamlines, you know, the, the the you know the the ability to get more users on board, you know, that from the Google community first of all, because it, it's it's sort of it's single sign on, right? It's uh, part of the functionality of this this new Google Plus integration is is something um, that is a um, over the ear install, so you actually don't have to go to the, uh, the the Android App Store and download the Google uh, or download the Banjo app. You you actually just pull it down automatically, uh, you know, via your Google Plus uh, sign on, um, which is really quite interesting that they they can do that now. And I think that's you know for for the Android community in general, I think that's that's going to drive you know a, a huge uh, amount of uh, of app downloads uh, for for various players. Banjo just being you know one of the first of those. You know, and and then just this the security and privacy you know pieces that come with you know Google Plus, you know layered into Banjo now I think it, it is really interesting. So I think there's a lot of, lot of pluses for this. Um, you know I, I think this is a good move for Banjo. It's going to help them you know just get better, even better entrenched than they already are within the Android community. So uh, I, I like this. Yes, uh, for app discovery, that's that's a pretty cool feature. I didn't know that about Google Plus that. That uh, you know you you don't have to go to Google Play to download the app. I mean, we see it all the time where you click on the download from the App Store and it takes you to the App Store to download it. And then you it's, you know if it's on your desktop, then you have to synchronize it with your with your device. Um, but I, I love that idea that that um, you know the the close integration between Google Plus and their 200 million uh, people who have uh, who use Google Plus and the Google Play, so that you can actually do the kind of app discovery that we're talking about. You don't have to download the app and then realize you have to sign in. You sign in and then download the app in the background. That is a I, I think that that is a is a monumental shift and a very smart move. If that's the way that it works with Google Plus and and with the with the Android platform, that's what you can do when you have that social network. And you can integrate it with the app network instead of what mm -hmm. you see like on Facebook, which is, hey, here's the app of the week. Here's your free app. Go go download it, and it'll take you to the right. app store. And, and I think that from discovery, that's that's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, so so if you're an app developer out there, uh, I guess the message that we're saying is go take a look at this uh, new Google Plus uh, integration. And yeah. See how you can get on it because it can only help you drive uh, you know drive installs. Yeah. Very cool. Of course, so. Banjo's at the leading edge of that. Uh. So we can, I'm going to have Damien on to talk about this and the impact that it's had on his business. He's at Mobile World Cong Congress this week, so we're going to connect with him next week and and uh, talk about you know the first couple of weeks as you know as one of the first companies for uh, Google Plus interaction and integration. So very cool. Our uh, third story here. This is a uh, an Irish company uh, called iMob Media, and they've launched now these guys. You know, we sound like broken records here, but we talk about the the that point of sale at the carrier that the carrier uh, will own. You know, they own location, they own your connection, they own your customer data, they they will own your wallet at some point. Um, and this is a company that's going to help match what location with deals and location with business and location with transaction. Yeah, I mean, in some respects, what we're talking about here is the European version of Placecast, uh, in, in my view. Uh, 
And, uh, you know, it, PlaceCast has done a phenomenal job of kind of being the, the backbone uh, to the carriers uh, in terms of giving them the, the platform to, to do uh, SMS-based geofencing. Um, and uh, obviously powers O2, powers AT&T, powers, you know, a number of, uh, of big, uh, of big uh, solutions out in that marketplace. And, um, you know, so for me, this, this, is, this is interesting to see that, you know, there's, there's another player emerging on the space. It, it's out of Ireland. Uh, very strong management team behind this thing. Uh, Brendan uh, Conway, who's uh, one of the founders, uh, comes, out of, comes out of this from the automotive fleet management uh, industry. So he understands tracking and navigation and location. Um, and then the, another guy who's, um, who's on their team, uh, Phil Com Comerford, uh, this guy uh, used to run uh, innovation at Telefonico too uh, as well. So, so, th so they've, got, they've got guys who know this industry uh, and, and know what the, what the needs are. Um, and and they're, they're coming at this uh, in an interesting way. And, and they're, it's not just a location piece. It's, uh, it's equally about you know, targeting and, and profiling users and, and the matching up of that with you know, their location from a uh, carrier perspective. So um, you know, I think this is going to be uh, a strong solution. Um, you know, it's, it's been picked by uh, a couple of, uh, you know, venture groups, uh, at, obviously in the Irish market and, you know, kind of, you know, th their version of TechCrunch disrupt kind of, uh, programs and things like that. So, um, looking forward to watching this one, uh, evolve and, and, uh, you know, uh, connect, I, I expect it's going to get some traction. Uh, there's they're speaking around they're talking about the right things here when it comes to the, the uh, you know customer retention and management so that they're, they're trying to reduce churn they're talking about direct marketing and they're talking about location-based advertising and deals and and drawing and driving business uh, into your business and then um, and then uh, loyalty and life cycle management and then I, I think that that's that's the continuum right and and you certainly want to be feeding one end so that and growing the other end which is life uh, you know uh, which is retention and and, um, and customer loyalty. So this this is this is a company, but like they're teaching carriers how to do this. Ultimately, aren't they? They're leveraging the carrier network to be able to, um, and the carriers, the carrier network, and the carriers network to be able to drive loyalty for businesses. But at some point, the carriers have got to own this. I, I can't imagine that they won't. But can they own it? Will they yeah. do a good enough job? Um, like, I gotta ask. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I think they can. I, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the carriers have, you know, the uh, the best thing going for them, which is they have, you know, a customer base, a sizable customer base, and a pre-existing billing uh, relationship. So they, 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 you know, custom the the subscribers are used to paying, you know, money uh, for for their for their phone service to these guys. So, you know, layering on services like this works well when it's when it's uh, pushed out by a carrier because. Uh, you, you can leverage those two things, you know, a loyal customer base and a pre-existing billing relationship, you know, make for, you know, easier adoption uh, by the consumer of, of a service like this. So, but, the, but we don't see typically the carriers going out and trying to build platforms on their own and, and, and you know, sort of do the technology side of this. So, you know, when an iMob Media comes along or a PlaceCast comes along and says, hey, you know, we've got the system for you um, and, and here's how it works, you know. I think carriers get excited because they see they see the opportunity um, and they know they've got the base to to leverage it. So, well, I, I just think back, Asifa. How many times have you said, "Oh man, I love my carrier. I love them." <laughs> right? Oh yeah, they uh, especially when they come back from every trip and I look at the roaming. Trip. <laughs> exactly, it's like <laughs> I I love them so much. I want to give them all this money every time. Like you know, I, I have a philosophy about carriers is that I, I don't I don't care how much money I owe them. Um, uh, until the the second last call before they cut me off, that's as long as it's going to take for them to get every dime out of me. I resent paying them, but I I have to yeah. pay them, right? And so I I, li yeah. I like the fact that a company like I'm, I'm Op Media are, is going to you know can can keep that at arm's length from the carriers. And I don't believe that the carriers. I honestly don't believe that the carriers have the capacity, the customer service capacity, and the understanding to be able to manage that process, which is customer retention. We mm -hmm. are a part of a carrier network. Why? Because we have to be, not because we want to be. And the businesses that we're talking about here that iMob Media is going after, which is, I think, why they'll have a long life cycle, is because th those businesses, are, you know, 
having retention and customer loyalty is very important to them because there are other competitors that can walk in there and take their business right away. Um, you know, in Canada, there's only a few carriers. In the United States, there, there are more. And in Europe, there's even more. But, uh, but it pales in comparison to how many bakeries or uh, restaurants or retail shops there are that are competing for the same business. So this is why I don't think that until carriers, in, until carriers get their act together and understand what it means to be customer service driven, um, I, I don't think that they have the capacity to do what iMob Media does. And so I think that that's a very lucrative spot for these guys and for PlaceCast. Yes, so. for sure. No, yeah, I, I expect big things from these guys. We'll see. Okay. So they're on they're on their way to the valley apparently to uh, try and drum up some uh, some fundraising cash uh, to grow this thing out. So we support them. iMobMedia.net. iMobMedia.net. All right, those are the first three stories that we're going to be talking about. We're going to dive into our uh, guest of the week. is John Fisher, who's the co-founder and CEO of Crowd Optic. We covered these guys uh, a number of episodes ago. Uh, Asif, why don't you set this up? Talk about what Crowd Optic is and and set set up the uh, conversation now with John. Yeah, I mean, this is a company that uh, I'm very excited about. I think the you know we're, we're talking about uh, you know a whole layer of of new uh, technology evolution around location when we're talking about crowd optic and, and what these guys are, are, are doing is is it's not just about where your device is uh, they're, they're looking at where your device is pointed um, you know they call it focus based applications and, and so you know picture you're, you're at an event you're at a concert you know where where are everybody's phones pointed from a camera perspective uh, right now or you know where's something happening in the middle of, of uh, you know a NASCAR race or you know what what's going on around you, and where where is your phone currently focused and pointed? Um, that layer of information and that sort of real time collection of data from that perspective, um, and combined with the actual location of the, the device itself, is 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 a whole new level of, of innovation that we haven't yet really uh, explored. And from a marketer's perspective, from a brand's perspective. Uh, from an event perspective, um, you know uh, that data combined with what what's actually going on is uh, is unbelievable in terms of what you can do in terms of analytics and marketing uh, potential. So, sat down with John uh, John earlier this week and uh, we had a great chat about it. We'll we'll do a, a I'm sure a much longer form interview with him at some point and get him on uh, get him on uh, on tether as well, Rob. But um, yeah, so here it is, John Fisher, uh, uh, founder and CEO of CrowdOptic. Well, it's that time again this week where we get to bring a wonderful guest on this show. And this week, it's John Fisher, co-founder and CEO of CrowdOptic. John, welcome to This Week in Location-Based Marketing. Thank you. Glad to be here. So let's jump right into it. Um, you know, CrowdOptic, uh, certainly a company that I'm somewhat familiar with and, and some in the industry might be. But why don't you tell our audience a little bit about who you guys are, what, what, you, what you're all about. CrowdOptic uh, lives in two forms, uh, both on a mobile device and also in content uh, metadata. And what we understand in real time uh, or after the fact, uh, respectively, is where the device uh, was pointed. So if you're in a crowd and you see something interesting that you'd like to uh, memorialize, uh, for example, one of our largest customers is the largest uh, sports and entertainment uh, entity in Australia and New Zealand, so a key piece of their mobile platform where you can get your phone around a stadium to find your Facebook friend, and then there's a variety of uh, services uh, that uh, that stem from that. That's an example of the the context of where you're uh, you're looking at an event, uh, or uh, if you are uh, uh, at a uh, a speech or a conference. Well, another large customer is Fora TV, that is the largest conference channel on the web, and because we know where the phones are pointed, uh, the content that they're creating is thereby authenticated and belongs on the uh, shared screen. So uh, we understand where the phone is pointed in that uh, type of context on top of location, which of course is your domain, is where we think uh, a lot of major enterprises are going. That digital precision of understanding not just where the uh, consumer is, but uh, when and where the consumer is, uh, uh, is looking uh, is a critical piece of it all. Right. So one of the things I love about you know what you're doing and and and, and the service the platform that you're offering is 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 that you know you're you're looking at where the device is pointed. And one one of my hot button issues in the industry today is when we look at mobile advertising, when we look at 
uh, you know, sort of the, you, you know, all these smartphones out there, for the most part, we're not really leveraging all the sensors in these devices. You know, we're, you know, from an advertising perspective, we take a, typically a banner ad and we shrink it down and we push it on a mobile phone, but we're not using the compass and the gyroscope and, you know, all the other stuff that's in there. And it sounds like you guys are leveraging, you know, lots of these sensors in there. So maybe if you would, you know, comment a little bit on what, why are you focusing on this opportunity around, you know, where devices pointed? What, what was the, op, you know, the big thing that the problem that you saw or the gap in the industry that created the opportunity for crowd optics? Well, uh, taking your uh, latter observation first, um, think of the way the news is reported these days. Think of the chaotic events from a major event like to the uh, sand storm on the west of the United States. Chevron fire recently near our uh, offices in the San Francisco area. Uh, and all of these events are chaotic. They're redefining a variety of, uh, of vertical markets in terms of the way uh, consumers uh, interact with their environment. So we thought the opportunity was to provide additional uh, precision uh, to uh, mobile uh, location. That is, it, it's so valuable. Understanding what consumers are doing in real time is so valuable that we need to get better at understanding them uh, beyond six meters uh, and who knows what direction they're, uh, they're facing. And so to the attributes that you mentioned, uh, pretty easy to pick up and pretty difficult then to subject to our secret sauce. Picking up means we have GPS, but then we also have vector, as you mentioned. And so with combining these attributes and subjecting them to uh, uh, what we have is triangulation out uh, and, and other analytics. And understand where two through n phones uh, are focused in real time through an app, or where they were focused as they took uh, pictures and video uh, after the fact through harvesting uh, image metadata. And again, this additional precision, uh, when you have hundreds of millions of dollars in spend at these large events uh, worldwide, or when the very nature of our environment is defined by mobile phones, there are big problems to solve on top of location. Excellent. So, um, I mean, it's, you mentioned early on, you know, the example with the Australian uh, sports uh, entity, you know, but maybe if you would, I, I mean, I, I, it's pretty clear to understand how this works from a consumer perspective in terms of the data that you're collecting and, you know, based on where those devices are pointed. But what is the opportunity for a brand? How does a brand leverage, you know, your platform? Yeah, we think that's really the end all. Uh, brands are uh, looking for that authentic uh, experience with their consumers. They, they want to participate in something that's real, and there's nothing more real than what the consumer is seeing uh, or has seen, where brands are increasingly sort of encroaching you know, social and other mechanisms on uh, consumers that way they can through harvesting uh, analytics. But in this case, to know, uh, and often cases with no change to the consumer experience at all, they're already using their phones, their phones are already in the air taking pictures if it's something that's worth taking a picture of, and if through a uh, large enterprise who's uh, our wants to have an app available, or through simply the uh, harvesting of uh, uh, image metadata worldwide, if you can understand just that extra ingredient about your consumer as an enterprise, if you can understand where your consumers are looking at the major events you own or produce, or if you are interested in uh, major happenings in the world because you report the news or you are in the content business, um, we uh, offer what these enterprises perceive as, um, you know, as, as a layup. I mean, location is ubiquitous. It wasn't 10 years ago. Yeah. Just a few years from now. Fantastic. So la last question here. Um, you know, if it, obviously the platform, the technology you guys are providing, th this is relatively new stuff. You know, there's, you know it's, it's not mass market yet that people are tracking, you know, where devices are pointed and all that kind of stuff. But two years, five years from now, what do you see, you know, either from coming from crowd optic or how, you know, how entrenched will this be within the industry? Well, we are uh, focused by, uh, by our uh, uh, methods. It sounds a little like cliche. I don't have a sales team. I've got 12 guys, mostly engineers. Uh, I like to focus only on the best enterprises I can get my hands on because by definition, the closer I get to them, the better my software gets. So we're not, uh, actually a consumer play. We let those enterprises then deploy uh, uh, or work with their own consumers, and that's how we built uh, uh, companies uh, uh, and careers in the past on this team. So it's not going to be a 
big splash uh, from CrowdOptic as a pure play. Uh, we are in a wide distribution right now and uh, often white labeled as, as uh, that's sort of the life that you sometimes choose as a startup. And we're fine with that, again, as long as our technology is uh, close to to these great enterprises. Uh, but in the future, I think you will see uh, more focus-based services. Uh, I think you're going to start uh, uh, hearing about that in addition to location-based services. And CrowdOptic is just about to uh, you know, hitch its wagon to uh, the class um, and caliber of enterprises where uh, you will see uh, uh, initiatives like this as a, as a standard. Fantastic. Well, Again, for our, for our audience, uh, we, we've had the privilege today of sitting down with John Fisher, co-founder and CEO of CrowdOptic. John, thanks for joining us on the show this week. Thank you very much. So thanks again to, uh, to John for sitting down with us uh, this week and, and sharing his insights into you know, what focus-based applications are all about and what that's going to mean for uh, marketers and the location uh, intersection around that. So, uh, John, thanks again for doing that. Um, all right. Let's, uh, let's move on to our, uh, our next story now. Um, this, for me, is a really interesting one. Qualcomm, uh, you know, obviously is, is a major player in the, in the uh, mobile chip uh, business, uh, and they've, uh, they've been promoting a technology called LTE Direct, which is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, technology for uh, transmitting uh, data between uh, mobile devices. Uh, and this has huge implications around location-based services. They're talking about, you know, this LTE Direct you know, really about speeding up the engagement, uh, making location-based services faster, more efficient, um, and, and it comes off of a, a system that they uh, they they uh, pioneered a few years ago, actually, in their labs called FlashLink. Um, but this whole idea of peer-to-peer, um, you know, information exchange, uh, I think, as a category, uh, is interesting. I mean, obviously, we could talk about near-field communications as a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, functionality. Um, you know, Apple. Currently doesn't support that, um, but uh, has uh, their own thing going on around magnetic fields and, and exchanging devices between mag you know the mag magnetic fields between uh, you know two devices. Now we have Qualcomm here talking about LTE Direct. I I really like where this is going personally, um, and, and so the idea behind this is is um, they they've developed a system called uh, Expressions, and so Expressions are. 128-bit packages of data uh, that uh, basically get expressed, uh, and and then devices are uh, are in a listening mode, ready to receive or send one of these uh, one of these expressions. And uh, currently, the functionality is looking at this from a you know a device-to-device uh, -device, uh, transmission, if you will, uh, of an of an expression. And 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 these these packages could be streaming video. They could be you know a text message. It could be you know a whole bunch of different things. Um, but but if you will picture uh, in a location-based framework, a brand or a marketer or, or a small business or a restaurant chain or whatever it is sending out an expression of an offer, um, and your device just casually in the background listening uh, for this in, in a in a peer-to-peer -peer context. The interesting thing about that is, is that uh, you know this is at the device layer. This is not an SMS message. This is not an app alert. This is not any of that. This is just native in the device itself, um, which you know the ubiquitousness of that uh, in the sense of I don't have to worry about you know did I download the Foursquare app or did I download this um, you know or have I opted in through the carrier even for an SMS uh, alert uh, a la iMob Media or Placecast. Um, you know, this is just native. Um, this this changes the game altogether. I think potentially, uh, depending on whether or not they can, they can get um, you know the uh, the device manufacturers to to adopt this capability uh, in there. You know, Qualcomm is 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 really pushing the boundaries on on uh, functionally uh, advancing the ability to do location. So whether it's LTE direct, uh, you know, for peer to peer information transfer, which is what this is about. Or you know, they uh, a few months ago they they announced a, uh, a a functionality within their chipset to actually measure altitude of a device, and we talked about the yep. importance of that yep. around indoor location. So you know, you're in a mall in Asia where the malls are are not you know spread out across you know acres and acres of land like they are in in America, but uh, you know they go upwards, they're vertical. Um, you know, so so the ability to know not just I'm in the building and and where I am in the building, but what floor I'm on. 
uh, is is really interesting. And, and and so these guys are really really doing great things at innovating at the chipset layer around providing the ability to share information and understand where some where somebody actually is and how to engage them. Yeah, one of the biggest challenges that a lot of companies that we've seen have, like the Moves app that I'm still so fascinated with, Flock, all of these always on in the background apps like this. Uh, as They're basically apps as service right now. And and this is we know that this is where things are going to go because we talked about this. The, the screen is so crowded right now, and, and it's so hard to get somebody to not only download an app but launch the app. Um, so if you can leverage this kind of, this kind of always on chipset, um, always in the background, that doesn't drain the battery like some of the apps that we're talking about mm -hmm. do. Uh, I, I believe that uh, you, you know all these guys can do, all Qualcomm can do, all uh, they can only experiment with these with these uh, with these this piece of technology and what they're doing to be able to bring services like that really to the forefront to be able to really hit this out and and you know I'm not saying that we end up in an appless world on these mobile devices, but you know wh when you have um, when you have services as a layer on the chipset. Uh, that don't drain the battery or that uh, that compensate for bad battery usage and control that experience. I think that you know we're only going to see great things coming from more great things and more innovation coming from the device layer. So yeah, pretty amazing. But they no. they, they what they did was um, this is a I, I don't know if this is this rolls from the LTE Direct, but I mean you showed me this video and we're going to show this video in a second, but. What, what, what did they? What was this? This was their marketing campaign. Yeah, this this is Qualcomm going out and and, and building a, a brand effectively with the consumer. Yeah, right. I mean, you don't think about chip manufacturers really being you know first uh, you know first uh, on a first name basis with with consumers, but Qualcomm uh, is out there. They're they're really pushing the boundaries, not just on the technology layer, but getting in front of people uh, as a brand, as as a marketer. You know. I, honestly, I, I I don't think it's long before we see Qualcomm uh, and, and others, Ericsson, uh, you know, and, and and others. I I've got a call come up with those guys this week as well to see kind of where they're going. But but I think these guys are, are starting to think about, you know, how do we get into into the mobile device, into the app space, into, you know, uh, interacting with consumers as household uh, brands and. Um, you know, they, they, they took a stab at this with uh, a very, very cool uh, out-of-home marketing campaign um, that blends mobile, uh, mobile web, uh, if you will, with uh, a transit bus shelter. Um, and uh, uh, just blown away with this. It's one of my favorite new videos uh, to show. Uh, and, uh, you know, here it is, Rob. Go ahead. Roll that video. If you are just listening to that, uh, I implore you to go and find it online. Just do, I mean, a bus shelter campaign, uh, Qualcomm's bus shelter campaign. Uh, I saw it, I found it on Gawker, it's on YouTube, um, but it's the best 
best bus stop ever. That's the name of the video. Wicked. Yeah. Wicked. Just, just amazing, amazing, you know, and uh, yeah, I, I want to be the guy with uh, it's uh, with the dog sled. That, 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 that's, <laughs> that's that's the one for me. It's the clowns. Oh man, it, yeah. yeah. So you know what? The only other company that has ever managed to really make a, a brand, a consumer brand, is the Intel brand, right? Which is the Intel inside. Everybody knows who Intel yep. is. Everybody knows what it is. Um, and it, it's always a it, it's a dicey situation simply to, to to kind of try to brand yourself from a, you know, a core tech, like the stuff that's in here that you don't even see um, as a as a consumer brand. But, uh, you know, it worked for Intel, which was demanding, at least for a while, which was demanding the Intel processor. Not not many of us knew why we were demanding it and what it meant, yeah. but we heard the, dun, 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 the Intel Inside song, and we, we knew that that's how we wanted it. And they did a great job branding that. I wonder if Qualcomm can do that, but... Yeah, and I just love the campaign in yeah. the sense of, you know, it, it, it's core to what we talk about at the LBMA, you know, a very location-specific ad campaign, you know, the blending and integration of media between, you know, mobile web, a bus shelter itself, you know, uh, which which is an ad by itself, uh, you know, transit shelter advertising. So, you know, the blending of those two things together uh, is just just a phenomenal execution, though. Yeah. Just, just great. So, good, all right. Good for them. All right, on to our uh, fifth story, and, and this is uh, close to the heart. I mean, I, I've got to start bringing some Ottawa stories in here because it seems like everything comes from Toronto when it comes to Canada, Toronto, Vancouver. So I'm going to look for an Ottawa location-based marketing story for one of the, an episode that's coming up. It might take me a while, but um, so uh, as a kid, I used to play with these cards, these cars all the time, Hot Wheels cars, uh, and as an adult, I play with Twitter all the time. So this is like the perfect mashup, and I spend most of my time in the mobile and location world. So this is Hot Wheels. Twitter, I drive a car as well, but a vending machine, uh, location-based vending dis distribution or disbursement, and uh, and a car show in Toronto. How's that for an intro? What the what? Yeah, I mean, this is just cool. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Canadian International Auto Show is where this happened. Uh, uh, Hot Wheels basically had a vending machine set up with a whole bunch of, uh, you know, a 1968 Chevy Camaro uh, replica Hot Wheels. Um and uh, they did this, uh, you know, as part of their 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 promotion of of the Chevy and GM uh, brands uh, at the show. And uh, what they did was is they basically set up this campaign where you could go up to this vending machine and you could tweet at Hot Wheels Canada. Um, and about fifteen hundred people did this apparently on uh, on on a Sunday at the show. And uh, it reckon the vending machine basically was set up to recognize, uh, you know, that tweet, recognize your your proximity to the machine and your location, uh, from that perspective, and then dispensed out a, uh, you know, one of these cars. So you know, this is just a great combination of using, you know, uh, Twitter uh, and and you know the location ability from that perspective, and 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 this vending machine. I, I love this kind of tie-in. I think this is this is just a kind of you know simple. Uh, yet effective, you know, way to kind of engage people with a brand and 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 make them feel like they're having a bit of fun at the same time. I, I love it. I, I mean, it's a um, it, it kind of reminds me of that uh, dog dispensing. I think it was IAMS that did it in in Germany or Finland, where uh, you basically walked up and you checked in with Foursquare at a location and and you got food. You got dog food, right? Um, yeah, just, uh, yeah, it's in Germany, and it's uh, called Granada Pet Food. Right, Granada, not yeah. I am, so my apologies. And, and uh, yeah. But it, it's the same kind of thing is that um, validates your location. It, it uh, dispenses based on a, a, you know, a, a Twitter post. And, and, you know, I was reading the interview, uh, which was an ad week about this, and, and it's by a Toronto digital shop called Trojan One, right, that came up with a concept. Um, oddly enough, they had a challenge with the BlackBerry API, which is unfortunate. But uh, they said that uh, they, they it didn't tweet out right when when it said hey i got a free camaro 68 camaro from from this it didn't tweet that out and i think that's the missing point in this is that you know you're not spamming I, th this is about awareness making and trending and creating trends and driving people to the to the uh, to the um to the uh, auto show right like I, I there's that one piece that's missing here for me is that while i'm there i could i this is a great experiment because i can get a free hot wheels car but they've got to also be able to create uh, context and awareness outside of those boundaries, which is if I'm walking down the street or if I'm at home and if I follow for some reason Hot Wheels, um, Hot Wheels Canada, at Hot Wheels Canada, and I start to see a number of tweets coming, hey, I got a free Camaro, hey, I got a free Camaro, come here to get your own, right? Like, I think that there's that, that yeah. thing, that 
that ability to to create awareness so that I can actually entice it entices people to go to the to the show. And I think that that's what's missing. It's great if you're there. Yeah, uh, you, you got you got to use these things to to uh, make make the make it a destination. Yeah. Right, yeah, that people absolutely. want to be at. Right, so um, you know the the good thing out of this is is that they get some positive brand uh, sentiment spin out of this. They they tripled their their Twitter following uh, for uh, Hot Wheels Canada just off of this 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 campaign alone. So so you know g- some good benefit there. Obviously, it could be taken a lot further, but uh, I like I like the initiative. I like that inter- that simple the simplicity of the integration between that vending machine and, and Twitter. So you know I. I, I do, and I love the fact that they they you know they triple their their uh, their Twitter following. That, that that's great. But I mean, this was done with uh, Chevy, right? Um, this was in partnership yeah. with Chevy and Toys R Us. What did it do for those brands? Right. So if I'm Toys R Us and I'm Chevy, I'm like, well, you know what? That's great that you at Hot Wheels Canada got three times the number of Twitter followers. Um, that's great, and we gave away all of these Hot Wheels cars. That's great. But what did it do for the Toys R Us? They donated it, and where was that interaction with the brand? Right. So I think that you've got to think is that that's great for Hot Wheels. What did it do for the actual people that were supporting this? And and, yeah. and if if you're going to do this in other events, you have to be able to show you know gate. That, that's the ultimate thing. Is that what's the gate? What's the draw? I, I, I want it, If I wanted to get my own my free wheel my uh, my free Hot Wheels car, um, I I should have been able to go down there and get it. And I think that that's that, that's the challenge here. Is that uh, well, and hopefully that means that you know the the follow on from this is that you know these types of machines are everywhere. now at Toys R Us stores, yeah. right? And you know, become a reason for you to go to the store because you can do this and get one of these things. And you know, it, it's the ticket into the store, which obviously, once you're in the store, then you just you buy more toys, right? Yep. So um, you know, so we call uh, the gateway yeah. drug, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, I like it. So do um, I. But but a lot more to be done around it. Experimentation, and that's what we want, right? We we we've been dying for something that's innovative like this. I'm surprised that from that time in Germany, we saw the four square check-in. We haven't seen a lot more of those kind of dispensing machines. And uh, so this, to me, um, do more of this stuff. But just finish the loop, finish that piece. It's not about Twitter followers, folks. It's about closing sales, right? All right, our our yep. last story. Um, and then I want to get your opinion about something. So stick around. This is the seventh story, but I want to. I, we'll finish off our sixth. Get ready for that, Asif. It's a surprise, um, but it's something that we've been talking about for a long time now. Um, listen, Sonar. We've talked about these guys. They uh, here's here's the story. Sonar uh, raised a little bit of money from the Bing Fund, and then I said the Bing what? So Sonar raising capital from the Bing Fund, and then it led that bigger question. I didn't even know that Bing had a fund. This is Bing the search engine, Microsoft. So yeah, I what <laughs> I felt the same way. Uh, so um, yeah, I mean that's obviously something that uh, we'll have to dig into a bit further and understand uh, what is the Bing Fund and and who else is in the Bing Fund because because I I wasn't aware of it. Um, but, but doesn't mean it's not great uh, just because I don't I'm, I wasn't aware of it, but. Anyhow, Sonar, uh, New York-based company, uh, Brett Martin. We've uh, we've followed these guys and talked about these guys before. Uh, nice to hear, uh, from my perspective personally, nice to hear that uh, these guys are still still going, uh, continuing to innovate, and obviously now have some some capital to help them move. Uh, Sonar's uh, uh, what I like about Sonar is is it's not just you know Foursquare, it's not just location sharing. It's it's very useful, uh, and I actually use this app a lot uh, when I'm on the road and when I'm traveling at, and at shows at conferences, because it's when you check in at a, a show like Digital Signage Expo as I did this week, um, it immediately scours you know all of the other check-in services and finds who else has checked in in the building uh, at that show. And it surfaces that information, and then quickly gathers together uh, all in one place the Twitter handles and the LinkedIn profiles and, and everything else about those other people uh, that are also at the show. So, kind of putting all the information together in one place to help you decide whether you want to reach out to them and engage with them, and whether there's, you know there might be a good business reason to to do so. So, that's one of the key value uh, points around Sonar uh, or or you know guys, apps like Unsocial and things like that. Uh, so really like this kind of space, this kind of um, you know business oriented use of uh, of location when you're at events. Um, so uh, glad to see they got some funding and uh, looking forward to learning more about the Bing Fund. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I did a little bit of research on the Bing Fund, and and it's um, these are basically uh, company. I mean, they're looking for companies that uh, you know are are in the. Uh, innovative disruptive space and I think it's it's much like an incubator like a uh, tech stars or something like that and if you're in the 
in the uh, Seattle area, um, you can actually go and be bunked inside there. If you're not, they, I mean, they, they're investing in a whole bunch of companies. They, I think they've got a couple of, they got a couple of companies that that are in. Uh, they got two startups in here, which are Buddy and uh, Opinion or Opinion. Okay. Those are two companies that that they're that they're doing. And they offer mentoring. They offer the same stuff, right? They offer subsidized use of unique APIs from Bing, which is really cool. Um, access certain technology assets developed by Microsoft Research, which is pretty cool. I'm going to assume that that's, that's worthwhile. Uh, they also offer things like assistance from the team. Uh, uh, they specialize in design, engineering, marketing, and building uh, businesses and consult uh, consultants and exposure to Microsoft executives and connections with partners and customers and funding and co-workspace and uh, each um, the, the IP that they're developing remains their own, and and in the frequently asked questions as I was going through it, it also said like, what you know, will Microsoft buy us? And they said, that, you know, there's we're not going to say no, we're not going to say yes, but oftentimes certainly there's a high likelihood that if the company is interested, like a company like Microsoft is interested in in investing in it, then then at least it's to test something to see if there's worthwhile an acquisition involved with that. So. Yeah, Bing Fund. If you're interested in the Bing Fund, Bing Fund, go to bingfund.com. And of course, uh, if you're interested in Sonar, it's sonar.me, S-O-N-A-R dot M-E. Pretty cool. We've been following yeah. these guys forever, which is which is excellent. Yeah. yeah. All right. You see, those were the six stories. I, I got it. We had a breaking story late last week, which was around, um, of course, the uh, Groupon CEO uh, getting gone. And I, I'm, I'm interested in getting your perspective of this. We haven't talked about this at all, but I'm very interested in, in understanding what you think about what, you know, uh, this was a, um, not a surprise, I don't think. They, they posted a, um, a loss. It wasn't as great a loss as I anticipated it was going to be uh, for this past quarter. But basically ousting the CEO and his departure message was, uh, was uh, you know, I thought at one hand was, was hysterical, but on the other hand was so flippant and pissed me off so much that it just showed me the kind of uh, blase, laissez-faire approach I think that these this whole company had to to building a business, right? Like, which uh, did you yeah, see that thing? Yeah, yeah, I did, and it's you know I, I wasn't surprised by him. I've I've, I, I've seen him speak right, yeah, uh, a couple of times, and th there's just a, a level of arrogance, let's just say that you know we're we're Groupon, you know we're 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 the biggest and the best, and and. Uh, you know, uh, we, we created a market, and uh, and therefore, you know, you know, we, we should we should be able to, uh, you know, do what we want and take it where we want, and it, it's a bit of that. And, and uh, you know, I'm not surprised that he's gone. Uh, I thought he would have been gone, you know, six months ago. Um, you know, I, th I think this is this is a good move by the board. They had to do something to shake this thing up um, and try and get it back on track. Um, and uh, you know, I still don't think the overall you know, premise of you know that that business is sustainable. Um, you know, with the capital uh, requirements in terms of people resources to go out and source all those deals. Um, but um, you know, the deal market itself isn't going to go away. Uh, I, ju I just I just find it uh, a very difficult. I mean, we we talked about Living Social last week mm -hmm. and and, mm -hmm. all, and their struggles as well. So it, it's. It's ripe for shakeup. Um, it's uh, you're going to see. I think both of those companies scale back from where they were uh, a year ago, even uh, in terms of s size and some of their international operations. Uh, that they've been going and buying companies in India and Malaysia and you know Brazil and this one and that one. And I think some of that's going to start to uh, get clawed back. And uh, you know, the, for me, the deal space works really well in in very local. Uh, context, right? It's you know when you build a platform as we've seen with like, like Scout Mob, you know in Atlanta that was just on our panel yep. there, or, or you know some of the ones that are just LA or just New York or whatever, um, and, and they get that traction because they live and breathe and work in that community, uh, and they know the businesses and the, and the founders you know can go out and knock on a door and say hey I'm you know so and so and from you know ABC company and you know we want to work with you and and you know I live across the street. And uh, you know, I have coffee here every morning, anyways. So you know, that kind of stuff is what we're you know what makes this this work. And when you try to scale that out, um, you know, uh, nationally or internationally, it's it becomes very difficult because you have to have you have to have that human capital to to execute it. Um, and so, anyways, it, it's uh, you know, good good luck, good riddance to Mr. Mason. 
Um, and, uh, I, I <laughs> you know, I, I hope he finds, you know, something else that uh, he can uh, be equally arrogant about. And, uh, you know, he, he's got to find something because, uh, if, you know, if you haven't if you haven't heard what he said, I mean, he, he wrote a uh, I mean, they had a dismal quarter. Right. A, and, and basically their stock is now um, three dollars. So it's dropped 89 percent since its public debut a year ago. Right. So it's at three bucks. And, and you know what? I don't believe that the stock price denotes whether or not a company can survive or not. The stock price is not is is a is a public reflection of what's going on in the turmoil inside. But it doesn't mean that because the stock has plummeted that much. That, sure, there, there's no confidence in the company that is for an investment. It doesn't mean that the company is bound to fail or bound to succeed one way or another. Um, it's just a, it's a market pull, market push. But uh, what he said in his in his statement in his in the letter that he sent out is that uh, I've decided that I'd like to spend more time with my family. Just kidding. I was fired today. Yeah. What an ass, right? Like, do you, can yeah. you imagine? Uh, okay, so you're an employee of the company. You're an investor in the company, or you've invested in a stock, a, a one stock, or a one one um, one one stock unit, or you've invested in, you bought a bunch of stock, and you've gone from, uh, you've you've dropped eighty nine percent in value in the last year under this guy. You are you're hemorrhaging cash. You 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 don't even know what we're business in. You're trying to take on too much, and uh, finally the board makes a move, which should have probably made the move six months ago, um, and then he comes out with that bullshit. Like that is astounding. This guy is a dick, right? A total, mm -hmm. absolute dick. And and I hope he never works again. F just for that statement. Just kidding. I was fired today. That kind of levity does not belong in the situation that yeah. Groupon is in. And I, who in the world would have confidence in this guy ever again? I, 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 I who, yeah. Where does this guy come yeah. from? Right? <laughs> I don't know, man. Right. But anyhow. Yeah. Um, so he, you know, he's I, gone. And I just wanted to get your opinion, right? And, and because. Yeah, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm happy for Groupon, actually. I, yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, it, at least maybe it gives them a chance to, to, to move in, a, in, in another direction and actually figure out something that's innovative and different. And, uh, you know, I, I hope they're successful. All right. Well, that's it. I honestly do. Yeah. I, I mean, maybe they will be now. Maybe they'll actually uh, retrench and, and, and get where they should be going because obviously this guy just didn't give a damn. Yeah. Oh, Andrew Mason. Andrew Mason, Andrew Mason. A name that we will soon forget. All right. So those are the seven-ish stories that were relevant uh, this past week. I had to bring in the Groupon story. I just had to, had to, had to because uh, we talk about it so often. Uh, if we missed your story, if you think that we've missed anything, if we should, if you'd like to contribute to any of these stories, there's a bunch of ways you can do it. You can reach out, rob at untether.tv, asif at the lbma.com. You can go to untether.tv forward slash talk and leave a voicemail, uh, 30 seconds or less, please. Uh, you can hit us up on Twitter at Rob Woodbridge or at Asif R. Khan on Twitter. You can do all of those things all at once, get our attention and uh, get us a story. We'll, we'll, we'll see if we can wind it into the stories that we choose for the week and, and we'll go from there. But please... Uh, have your voice. Have it said. Speak. Let us know what you think, please. Our last piece of business. Here's the resource of the week, which is a pretty cool infographic that you dug up. Where is this from, Asif? Uh, it's been released by Milo uh, Shopping, which is eBay local. Um, uh, you know the old Milo team, which is is, is part of eBay. The data is coming from uh, Immer uh, and uh, Ballyhoo. Immer is actually great. Uh, Dr. Phil Hendricks down in Atlanta, who was at our event this week as well, is 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 the founder of Immer. So he he's a he's a guru around location based research and. Uh, Really appreciate uh, his input to the community. So, just a great study on local search and kind of what that means for brands and retailers. Uh, uh, a couple of quick numbers: uh, four four out of ten individuals use local search once a day. Two thirds use local search at least three to four times per week. Um, you know, so so good stuff going on there. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I was looking at is is uh, shoppers. You know, they looked at shoppers indicating what type of information they're trying to find when they're doing uh, search uh, for retailers. Um, and you know, right at the top, uh, you know, of that is, is, you know, after hours of operation and websites and 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 whatnot is, you know, the listing uh, information and the map address, uh, you know, and distance from where where people are. So, you know, the location obviously being very central to what people are looking for uh, on that. And uh, I guess probably the most interesting stuff is that sort of ten mile uh, radius in terms of. Um, the distance that people are willing to travel, and and, and Jaiwire has put out some some studies like this in the past as well, 
uh, you know, to, to get to a retailer um, uh, is interesting. So we'll have this data up uh, on uh, the lbma.com forward slash research. Uh, you, you can pull this infographic down there. Did you want to say anything else about it, Rob? Yeah, the, those two statistics were staggering to me was that, uh, you know, sometimes we think that uh, we have to be complex when we think about mobile and location and marketing. And when, when you see the, the the big majority about this is about, uh, so, okay, uh, how long are you open and how do I get there, right? And how do I reach out to you? Are the, are the number one, two, three, four, five, and six things that people are doing on these devices when they're trying to find your business? It just shows you that you know, no matter how complex you think it should be, it's the simplest things that are going to win right now. Yeah. That's what that's where the market is. So remember that the first steps should always be, hey, let me know where you guys are or how when you're open until and and uh, and that's a great thing for customer support. So that if you do that through a mobile version of your website, then all of a sudden you don't have to answer the phone, right? Let people self serve. And the the second thing is that the near, far, and in between. 10 minutes or less, you know, the distance that shoppers will travel for a retailer. And as you mentioned, that 10 mile radius. And I think that this is very interesting when you start to think about how you overlay discounts and coupons to drive people in, because there's an equivalent study that was done for how far people would go for discounts. And, uh, you know, they said that uh, they would they would come 45 minutes in for a 20 to 25 percent discount. So don't don't do it. If, if they're five minutes away. And I think that that's what this is. Uh, also, it shows you that people are willing to get up and go um, to, uh, you know, 10 minutes or less to get to your, uh, yeah. your retailer. They're willing to go there already, right? 56% say that they're willing to go there already. That, that means you don't have to discount it if they're existing customers. Right. right? So I, I just be smart about how you play with these numbers. This is a great, this is great insight. Just those two numbers alone can change your business. I think. Very cool. For sure. Yeah. The lbma.com slash research for that. It's a great infographic. And uh, among all the other things that uh, Seif and his team do at the LBMA, there's tons and tons and tons of research that can help you tweak, massage, and grow your business right there. Yeah, and, and just you know, just to wrap things up, while you're there visiting uh, the site and looking for research, click on the events page because we've got a ton of events this, this month uh, going on all over the place. Uh, and we encourage you to come out and, and attend them. There's events uh, uh, just this week, actually, on the 6th. Uh, in Amsterdam on uh, city marketing, there's uh, we've got uh, an event coming up uh, March the 19th in in London, uh, March the 20th in Berlin. Um, you know, so there's plenty of stuff uh, going on and and happening all over the place. Uh, we're going to be doing an event uh, uh, shortly to be announced, but uh, you, you heard it here first, uh, April the uh, the third, I think it is, uh, in San Francisco as well. Um, and uh, you might, you know, you might, you might see Rob there. Even you never know. <laughs> <laughs> if it's warmer than where I am right now, you will see me there. Why can't we do yeah. these in Mexico, right? Yeah. Like Media exactly. Post does these things in the Bahamas and Mexico. We, we, that's what uh, I'm waiting for the LBMA retreat in Mexico or the Grand Cayman okay. Islands or something. Um, see what we can do. Yeah, exactly. And don't forget, we will be in uh, Toronto this week. Uh, if you're here uh, in Toronto on Wednesday and Thursday uh, at DX3 Canada, March 6th and 7th. And, uh, and also don't forget, hit us up on iTunes, rate this podcast. If you think that it's a great podcast, even if you don't, we'd appreciate you lie just this once. We won't tell your parents, tell iTunes that it's a great podcast. Just do that wherever you download this. It doesn't have to be iTunes. It can be on Stitcher. It can be anywhere. So please leave a great review for us. And if you don't like it, reach out to us as you have our, all of our information. And uh, I, I can't wait. Uh, this has been a great episode. We appreciate John Fisher, uh, spending some time with us, Eve. These are the six great stories. We're going to get, going to be on as a uh, as a guest of Untether.tv to dive deeper in and uh, just show up to one of these events. Well, Jen, let's shake hands. That's all we ask. Let's just do that. No punches. Shake hands. And if you happen to be Andrew Mason, I don't want to. I don't want to meet Andrew Mason. I just don't want to meet that guy. So, Asif, can we kill this one? We done one nineteen. Well, I think I think we're good. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I am. Um, I'm going to step away from this podcast due to family reasons. Uh, no. 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 We'll be back for episode number 120 next week. See you, Steve. Safe travels, man. <laughs> All right, bye. Hello, everybody. It, oh, yeah. If I could just speak. <laughs> that should be me. I'm the one who just woke up. <laughs>